And hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Your Money Radio. Danny Stewart, uh, Don Vandenborg uh, with you live. Whenever you're listening to us, we are live with you. Uh, a couple of things I want to do. Market. Wow, market. Market is uh, S-T-R-O-N-G off the lows. We'll talk about that. Talk about some options trades. I want to talk about gold and silver with you. Um, Danny's got some interesting things. He promises me he will make them interesting. And then... Um, you know, and I, I think, though, I want to start with Don. What's your shirt say? Uh, it's a Disney shirt. It says, I'm grumpy because you're dopey. Where are you wearing that shirt at? Because who 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 is that aimed at in where you're at right now? Uh, it, it varies minute by minute. Good actually. luck. Actually, you know. Good luck. You're in New it's Jersey. A, you're in, it's very flexible. New- I am in New Jersey. Uh, uh, it's a very flexible shirt. Uh, you get dopey, I'm going to get grumpy. It's that simple. It's that Pretty sample. Good. As Ross Perot would say, it's that sample. There you can go. You, can uh, I finish? You can. You can. Did you finish? I finished. Oh. You got the fantastic. chicken man and the potato chip man, and you have me. Who are you going to pick? Who was the potato chip man? The potato chip man was uh, George Bush, because he said, I don't care if For we're sure. selling potato chips or microchips, as long as we're creating jobs. Fantastic. And the chicken man was Bill uh, Clinton because he's from Arkansas and there's just a bunch of chicken farmers there. Do the younger people in our audience know who Ross Perot is? That's a great question. I'm being I'm not being facetious when I say that. I'm 44. So I grew up with the Saturday Night Live skits of Ross Perot. And by the way, what they did to Admiral Stockdale is a crime. Like Admiral Stockdale is an American hero. Um, but uh, I wonder how I wonder where the, the Mendoza line is for knowing ross perot and his presidential run of 92 that was 92 right uh i believe so and that is why george bush didn't get reelected. that handed yeah. the election to bill clinton with the lowest percent of uh popular vote i believe ever because it was split really? between three candidates well listen you know what they say it's the old adage without without a ross perot you don't get an albert gore vice president so let me tell you something. And and quite frankly, the internet might not be here. So that's let's a good just, point. So <laughs> yeah. So let's do this. I want to talk about the markets here real quickly because uh, they're pretty strong off the lows today. And if you've been paying attention, stock nerds and market lovers, and I hope you have been, uh, the Nasdaq opened up down. Uh, let me just get my marker energized here. Uh, they op- they opened up down. Oh, the futures anyway. When the cash session finally opened. They were down about uh, two point, at least 2.3%. And you can see the NASDAQ futures here are down half a percent. But what I want to draw your attention to is uh, the 21 moving average, or the 21 period uh, moving average, or the mean as it's known. And so just for those that orient themselves every week on these average true range charts, one, two, and three to the upside, and one, two, three to the downside, this is a really big deal. And so um, what I want you to do is put your market, you know, whatever you think about the coronavirus, whatever you think about the economy, the $600 uh, a week that's going away, whatever uh, stimulus bill might come. If you just paid attention in the vacuum, you'd, you'd buy something today off of your watch list based on this price action. And so uh, that might seem uh, like hearsay to some of you, but if you if you're rule based, that means you're just operating in a in a you're operating in an emotional vacuum. Did I say that right, Danny? Emotion emotionless emotional. You did. You did. Okay, you're operating in an emotional vacuum as the Nasdaq overtakes or retakes the 21 today. That that's a really big deal. Now whether this continues uh, and we trade sideways or higher from this point on. I don't know. It's a market and anything can happen. But that that's that's the whole nature of markets. It's not they, they call it trading and investing. They don't call it. I know what's going to happen tomorrow. If you want the risk free rate, like you want to make money risk free, you're going to buy bonds, which are paid what, Danny? Point, you know, point yeah, percent. Not, not much. Right. Yeah. The risk free rate is, is is just zero. Like The risk free rate is just about zero because inflation outpaces the risk free rate. And so if you take a modicum of risk, what you're going to see is that this is where you you would want to buy as you're overtaking uh, the 21. And so I want to get some Don's thoughts on that real quick. But I did do a trade uh, this morning 
before the show, and I'll bring us up to a five minute chart on uh, Tesla. And so Tesla opens up, Tesla opened up down, down a 140, something like that. Uh, it, it, it continued to sink. Uh, and then as it started to move in conjunction with um, the NASDAQ, what I, what I wanted to do was get a piece of that. And so Danny, where's our entry on Tesla? I got a, I didn't look at the, uh, I didn't look uh, at, uh, it, it, the it was around the 1417. I can look real quick. Uh, 14, okay. Yeah. 17. Yeah. So uh, where, where is that? in time and space of Tesla. I bought Tesla as it was doing what? Coming off the mean. So Tesla is, here's the mean, right? And so uh, this is the first time Tesla's been down at the mean, Don, since below a thousand or right around a thousand. And so it finally comes back and checks back to the mean and it's taken a while. It took earnings to do this. And so now I'd like to get a little piece of Tesla to see if it can work itself back up, maybe do a gap fill. Let's see if it wants to trade sideways. And then, uh, but that, what I just described to you is what we talk about all the time here at Revere. We're talking about lower risk entries. What's a, what's a high risk entry and what makes this a low risk entry? A high risk entry, a high risk entry is buying it at the third ATR. Even though it might go higher, there's a, the probabilities are just 70 to 80% that you pull back. And so instead of chasing it up here, and I get it, $1,400 to eventually a little over $1,800. And it's just a wild journey. You want to participate. Maybe you got uh, some of the FOMO. This is, this is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic entry. And if it starts closing below the 21 or the mean, you can simply just stop yourself out and you can use position sizing as your weapon at two and a half percent. It's a pretty volatile stock that travels about $114 every day. That's the average true range. So two and a half percent in this market environment is good enough for government work. As I say, Don, let me get your thoughts real quick on the markets and we'll, we'll progress with the show a little bit. Well, I, I bought Tesla yesterday off of oh, a five-minute okay. chart, and that's one of the uh, least successful trades so far I've done for a while. So Tesla gapped up after hours, got oh, as high as 1,700, uh, pulled back. Uh, you want, do you want the after-hours chart? No, no, just the daily. Uh, this Oh, the daily. I apologize. Let me get back to a daily for you. There you go. Oh, here you go. So what it did, it had support at 1550 from the prior two days. It touched that early yesterday and it bounced, got back above 1600. I bought it right around 1600 and pretty much top tick the rebound. It just trickled lower the rest of the day. I looked at where the 21 EMA was and my position size is puny, only one and a half percent because of how far it was from the 21. So even I was down 12, 13 percent this morning, but still within the 0.33 percent threshold that of the overall portfolio that I want to be in. So again, proper position sizing and understanding where your exit is, uh, is, is the key to capital preservation. So now, you know, you break today's low, I'm out on Tesla and it shouldn't because that corresponded with the undercut and reclaim of the 21. And so what we're talking about stock earners and market lovers, uh, low risk entries and stocks, it's not, you never hear us say uh, something to the effect of wait for your price, uh, determine your price. I don't know what my price is. Like I don't have a set price in mind. I don't have $1,400, I don't have $1,300. I know where the algorithms are written to drive a stock. We all, you know, we all do. We talk about it every week here with you and during the other five videos we do uh, during the week. And when it hits those levels and highly uh, in the top, you know, five to 10% of the fundamental technical stocks that we typically buy here in the shop, that's your entry. And it's not its not so much waiting for, quote unquote, your price. So many of you have uh, a determination in mind of what your price is, or you come to the trade with some baggage and Danny did something on Twitter. Don, Danny did something good on Twitter. And I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, usually Danny's not good on Twitter. And I, yes, you can see Danny's surprise. <laughs> you can see Danny's surprise here. So let me pull up Danny's Twitter feed real quick. 
And let me show you something that he did here. And he highlighted. Um, and did you I just do your touchdown dance before crossing the goal line here? You, yeah, uh, yeah, that was I good. Took knee, I took a knee first, and then I crossed uh, the touchdown. Uh, so keep going. This, this, I don't know who this guy is, I, and I really don't. I'm not being facetious with you. This is this is just what he wrote. He's a perma and, man. He's a perma Okay, man. well, I, I, yeah, I don't know him from anything. What does he say? What is – I'm highlighting. Oh, contrarian economist. Hold on. Now I'm going to make fun of him. What the a contrarian, contrarian economist. I am the a hell contrarian does that economist. Mean? You know what I am? I'm a contrarian on carbs. That's why I look so good. <laughs> Fuck is a contrarian economist. What a douche. Give me a break. Now I am mad. I'm mad that I, Danny, I, I was all happy. But whenever anybody labels themselves contrarian economist, oh my God, what do you do at home for fun? belittle your wife here comes the contrarian economist i mean god almighty he must be a joy to be with contrarian economist how pissed off is the contrarian economist that the market is where the market is and it's not a, a ne like the dow should be negative twenty two thousand, right can you get negative twenty two thousand on the dow no anybody brad where's brad at where the hell's brad at to tell me anyway so look at brad here what do you call a company of virtually no actual growth uh, up over 500%? Well, Brad, I think you call the person who's not participating bitter. God, Danny, I wish I wouldn't have read this now. Danny, you did something great on Twitter. And then I actually looked at what this dude's profile says. And now I'm angry because he is emblematic of everything that's wrong with the way people look at markets. Oh, he's fighting the market. He's fighting the market. Well, that's the thing, right? Like, if you want to actually be able to operate in the markets, you have to be able to do it without contrarian Bias. economist. <sighs> anyway, okay, so let's read what uh, old Brad wrote here. So Brad says, tulip, electric, suck, lemons, automobile. And and yet you're you're not participating. And Danny, Danny goes on to kind of outline what what we say here. And and by the way, though. That doesn't limit us from selling. Don, I think I've been in Tesla four or five times this year, just taking taking chunks out of it for clients, right? Like, is it four or five now? How many times have you been in Tesla, Don? Something like that, three or four. Yeah. yeah, and so just make your money or more importantly, protect your money if it's not working for you and then move on. But when you start forming opinions, about well, so, so here's another thing he's saying you know it has no no earnings right amazon didn't have earnings for a whole decade because they were yeah, stealing market share and they were going up and it was one of the best performing stocks so you wouldn't know amazon if it didn't have earnings well that that's true yeah, but a lot of people that's... couldn't hold amazon through the dot-com implosion uh, and, and got that. Like, right. yeah it went down 97 percent. and so what we always advocate is here the velocity of money and understanding your rules for entry and your rules for exit and that makes all the difference in the world and and so uh look whether or not tesla works out this isn't for me uh about tesla or arguing for tesla or or trying to make uh trying to talk the hype up for tesla this is just my rules and and i think that makes all the difference in the world and so um i think that approach is what you need I, I think more than any other year that we've done this, Danny and Don, uh, that that emotional list approach is what is what you need. You know, um, give you can I give you another example real quick, and then we'll actually get on with the show that I wanted to do. Sure. Uh, yeah, because I, I just thought of it. I sold uh, Skyworks yesterday. S W K S. And someone's going to say, why why did you sell Skyworks, man? It's only down uh 28 cents is down two tenths of a percent well it, it reported earnings and my earnings rules tell me that you know shaped over you know and my earnings rules just aren't blind they're they're the callus of learned experience over the course of years of trading and investing and so do i want to go into it though i've got like a 10 percent gain okay and why where's that come from most stocks won't correct uh they won't close down more than 10 percent typically uh after an earnings report so if you got a 10 percent cushion you have a good chance of coming out at least flat um okay well if i don't have a 10 percent gain what's the chart look like we'll just chart and then what's the expected move 
uh, and IV, implied volatility. I take all that into account and I make a decision as whether or not I'm going to hold the stock or not. I, I used these two for CDNS this week and I used uh, this one to hold uh, Chipotle and a couple others. And so, look, did I have to take a 1% gain or a little bit over that in Skyworks last night? No. Would I have been okay today? I would have been, but I don't know the outcome. I don't argue the validity of the idea. I don't argue that Skyworks is Skyworks. How could you sell it? You'll never hear me say that. It's a rule-based approach. Are you going to miss some? Yeah, but you got to be okay with missing some. Does that make sense, what I said? And do I yeah, because you're, yeah, you're also not going to catch big downers. Okay, let's do this, Danny. I want to get Danny's. We had, I'm, I think we, when clients or potential clients call us, I think when they relate stories that uh, probably affect, I don't know about 90%, but a lot of the people that listen to the show, I think we have an obligation to share them where they're not too personal. And Danny has uh, scrubbed his story. It's the, I'm calling this Danny's annuity story, kind of like Brian's song. You know, come on, pick a low. No, Don, it's not even going to get you a smile. Come on, Don, it's now, the pick. I, I don't see the relationship between the two of them. No. I, what's, they're, and, they're, and Brian's song is a great movie. If you didn't cry watching Brian's song, you're not a human. Well, no, that's the relationship, crying. Everybody cries during Brian's song. And when people get sold annuities and they realize the truth, they cry. That's why it's speaking, Brian's song. Speaking, I see. Of the young, speaking of the younger Our, generation not knowing who Brian's song is. That, oh, that was oh yeah, Brian, Brian Piccolo. Was Brian Piccolo a Penn State fullback? I think he I went to Penn State. I, I think he did, yeah. Uh, Matt Suey, another famous Chicago Bear, went to Penn State. Now, nobody knows who Matt Suey is. I know who Matt Suey is. Matt Suey. Number 26. Penn, yep. Number number 26 in your roster, number one in your hearts. Um, well, I'm a Notre Dame so, fan, so he wasn't number one in my heart. I'm from a small town, and you either loved Notre Dame and hated Penn State or vice versa. It was the big uh, rivalry. That's the big rivalry, yeah. Um, so Danny uh, had someone call him, and – the things I kind of almost wish Danny didn't tell me any of this so you could get my natural reaction and Don's natural questions. On the morning call that we do every morning, Danny's telling us about this phone call and this annuity issue that this person brought to him. And the travesty of these annuities. And look, don't tune out, stock nerds. Don't don't tune out. I'm gonna we're gonna do options, we're gonna do all the stuff that we normally do. But this, this is what happens to your parents every day. If your parents have retirement accounts, if, you're, if you work at a place that has a 401k or 403, for, you know, a teacher's annuity or you know, a, a public servant's annuity, a public servant's pension fund, what Danny's going to describe to you is happening to your loved ones. And, and they're being targeted. And you have to understand all of this so you can help them. And they don't know what they don't know. Nobody would know any of this of what I'm talking about. So, Danny, take it away. Uh, well, so uh, a, a lady called me last night, and she had been listening. She had been, you know, watching Don's Lunch and Learns and listening to our, our Daily Market Insight, even this podcast. And she heard me a couple of weeks ago say that, you know, you always hear about, you know, a long time ago, you used to hear about buying cheap term and investing the difference, not life insurance. Life insurance, not buying these big, right. expensive life insurance policies. And so she goes, I just want to ask you a question about that because I've been pitched, I've been asked, you know, to invest in three different life insurance policies: one for her, one for her husband, and either one for her daughter or granddaughter. And you know, I'm just going, well, how old's your granddaughter? Anyway. So it's a universal, it's not an annuity, it's a universal, I mean, it's an indexed life insurance policy. It's an index, okay. those are the new, new version where they, and I said, and she said, you know, they're asking me to put in $20,000 a year per policy. So that's 60,000 a year in order to kind of pump up the cash value. And then after five years, it'll have a big cash value. And then you can borrow, get, take a loan against it. And, and so it's it's tax, it's not considered a distribution. And I said, well, it's your money anyway. And and then you can have, and I said, look, 
first of all, life insurance can't be sold as an investment. It's not how it's supposed to be sold. It's actually a violation. It's not sold as investment. Life insurance is to insure a risk. So what risk do you have to insure? What are you, what are you trying to insure? First of all, because, well, you know, I'm not sure about that. They were really always talking about the, the cash value, the investment aspect of it. And I said, look, if you're doing $20,000 a year per policy, 60 grand, over five years, you obviously got some pretty good cash flow and you got some assets. What do you need to borrow money for? And by the way, you're borrowing your own money. You're borrowing your own money. And, and all of those, those indexed insurance products or indexed annuities, no matter what they tell you, no matter what illustration, whenever you hear the word illustration, substitute it for fantasy, um, they'll show you an in, they'll show you an illustration based on eight percent. Why eight percent? Because that's the maximum they're allowed to illustrate. They can't show you twelve, and it'll it'll never make eight. It'll never make eight because yeah, sure, in down years it can never go down, but they're either capped with a cap or monthly averaging or what have you. And so, in a few good years, you may make six, seven, eight percent. In down years, you make zero, and you average that all together. No matter what, it's about a two and a half to three percent return. That's how they're mathematically built. And they're, they're hard, you really gotta dive deep into the mathematics. And they're so confusing, none, none of those people, most people can't understand it, okay? So I told her, I said, first of all, you need to see if you need to insure anything. Is there a, is there a reason you need to be there for, uh, you know, college funding or, or what have you? But it, it's $60,000 a year, even if you just make 7% a year, then in, in a few years, you're self-insuring. You got plenty of money. You don't need to do that. So don't do that. So then that led to, so that's one thing, which is- Just real quick. So wrong. it was gonna cost her $60,000 to buy into this life insurance, this indexed life insurance policy. Yeah, it was gonna cost her $60,000 a year so she can borrow from that $60,000 a year, a year <laughs> and pay interest on the, on the loan. <laughs> So it's, it, you're paying yourself back, but still, it's it, the whole thing is just, it's, it's nonsense. So, so the loophole, though, is that if she's borrowing money, she's not paying taxes on it, right? Is that what the loophole is? How they, how they well, try to sell you on that? Well, that's one thing. But Don, remember, if you've got $60,000 that you've already paid tax on, and you need to use the money for something, you don't pay tax on that money either. They kind of gloss over. Well, that. you said, well, you, but you wouldn't be paying tax on it. It's already tax sheltered, right? You haven't paid tax on it yet. It's an IRA. Well, no, she didn't say an IRA. I'm just saying it's a life insurance policy. So she puts money in and it grows. And when she takes it out, if she takes it out as a distribution, then her return of principal is in tax, but the growth uh, will be taxed once she takes it out. Well, that happens anyway with a, taxable joint or individual account. And you don't have to rely on their crazy formula that you can't figure out. And and you didn't even talk about what we talked about on the call this morning is that the two the two different phases of the annuity. One is the contribution, which if you try to get your money back before you actually start collecting, there's big surrender penalties and there's big fees to the person that sold it to you. But then once you start the annuity phase, if you get hit by a bus, your money is gone. Yeah, unless so you unless you have it set up to a survivor, which in case, in which case your payout would have been lower in the first place. So so what Don's saying is annuities have two different phases. There's an accumulation phase where you stick money in, you grow it, you put money in, or, or a permanent life insurance policy, you put money into the cash value account, and whether it's in some kind of indexed formula to promise to pay you some kind of return based on some bond index or stock index. Again, it's gonna have caps or just a, a fixed interest rate. Uh, uh, that portion, when you put the money in, there's a big commission normally paid. And so you've got surrender penalties for seven, eight, nine years for a long time period. It can be shorter, it can be longer. And so you lock up your money and it's hard to get it out without paying a big surrender penalty. Okay. Then once you annuitize it, meaning you take an income stream for life, and by the way, they scare people into saying, oh, don't you, you don't want to worry about it. You want to check your brain at the door. 
just take this income for life and you never have to worry about running out of money. Well, if you take 300,000 or whatever the dollar amount is and you give that to an insurance company and they annuitize it and guarantee you an income stream, if you get hit by a bus the next month, that whole 300,000 goes to the insurance company. So you've exchanged a asset for a cash flow stream for life. Now, so the only way to really quote win on that is if you live past your life expectancy by about five or six years because they built in a profit margin, all that kind of stuff. Guess what? If you've got a, a an account that you manage or have managed and do a good job, you can send money to yourself every month on a on a on a regular basis, systematic payment. And then if your air conditioner blows up, you can also get a lump sum of four or five any month. So it's much more flexible. Once you annuitize that and, and lock in that stream, it's locked. You can't change it. And by the way, if you have big inflation, that in that payment is going to feel like less and less because you can't protect it. And you can't move into commodities or gold or something that will do well during an inflationary time period. So the problem is you, you just gave up control of your money. And if you do a good job managing your money, not only you can have your cake and eat it too, not only could you get an income stream, the corpus, the principal of what's left can go to your heirs or a charity or whatever you want. And so the whole thing is, is just crazy. But here, the main thing is, I don't even think she needed the life insurance. She doesn't need the life. They've got assets. They've got, you know, enough to live on. They've got a nice cash flow. They've got assets. I mean, look, if you can afford to pay 60 grand a year out of pocket to pump up three different policies, you know, what are you insuring? What's the insurance for? So it's, about the, it's about the broker's retirement. It's not about her retirement. Yeah. This is why Danny is America's fiduciary. So no one's going to tell you this. What Danny just explained to you is the God's honest truth about why these things are so horrible. And I rag on them constantly. Danny, what did you mention? Who gets targeted for these things? Uh, you, oh, da oh. Danny was talking. Okay. Well, so one, one reason, one reason that the insurance companies have really have a big push into the 401ks and the 403b space is not only because they get fees to manage the plan and do the ongoing 401k plan, but it's a big payout on the back end because they have the census. They have all the uh, retirement dates. They know when people are about to retire coming up in a year, six months, and they start getting them ready. They start, you know, uh, warming them up to, oh, you need a lifetime income so that right when they retire, rather than doing a, a um, IRA rollover where you can manage it and own Apple or Amazon or Netflix or Tesla, like you said, or a bond, they sell you to do a immediate annuity, which is the second phase, the, the distribution phase. They annuitize it. So you get an income stream for life and they make a huge commission on that. And so they love having that big stable. It's a ready made, it's a many ready made market that they can market to. It's their so so the product. Product. Yeah. yeah. And so it's like fishing in a stocked pond because they all they already have them enrolled in 401ks. They already have them enrolled in 403Bs. And so they 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 they're sizing you up and 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 gonna scare you. Exactly. They, they got a captive yeah. audience. They got a cap, and they really do it with four or three Bs in the and the uh, government and non for profit uh, uh, groups. I see it with teachers all the time. I mean, it's 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 terrible. Um, and so, but, but they, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, well, what I, doctors, market lovers, this is what happens every day in this industry, and why we we just rail against it. It's it's awful. It shouldn't happen. Uh, but it's not you. I, I always think that the people that watch these, watch us um, in the videos four or five nights a week and watch the video podcast, they're not doing this, but it's their loved ones because they don't know. And you don't know what you don't know. You're you, someone. And the worst part is it's friends that are doing like friends that are in the industry are selling their friends and family on this nonsense. And they're not your friends, man. Like, uh, the, they're not your friends if they're doing this to you and it's not right. And so many of you won't break that relationship because you don't want to offend. It's not right. What they did to you in the first place is not right. It doesn't make them evil. It just makes them evil. So. It doesn't make them evil. It just makes them <laughs> evil. <laughs>
and right. conscious and, and, and incompetence. Yeah, and, and people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that the person you went to school with or the person that is your next door neighbor who told you the greatness of all this. You don't want to hear something awful. Like, and we don't sell anything. Like, we're, the strategies to which we talk about, we espouse these videos, that's what we do for people. And we empower individual investors, whether or not you become a client of the firm or not, or ever engage with us, call us, or look, it, it, as long as we can help you any way we can. We have people call us all the time to say, ask us questions about stuff. And we're, we're here for empowerment. We grow because you send us your friends and loved ones. It, it's that and we, don't, and and we don't just help you once a quarter. We help you every hour of every day. Oh, oh let's talk, you want to talk about that? Well, yeah, so so I want to keep going. That that was just the beginning of the conversation. Oh, Jesus, Danny, hold on a second. Let's just let's just let, you've been talking for a while, and they need to hear me. <laughs> I've been talking for a while, really? I've been talking for a while. Seriously, Danny, we need to give them action. It, it, it dovetails. It dovetails exactly with what Don's talking about. All right, All right. you, you I'll, get I'll, you I'll get allow. seventy-six more words, Dan, to to okay. finish your point. So, so then, so then she mentioned that she came from a place, a brokerage firm like A.G. Edwards, like that. Okay. And she said, and I transferred to where my dad has his money. He transferred over and it's an advisor. It's a fee-based only advisor and they charge 1%. And she said, but so I have that question for you. Do you think that 25% bonds and 7% money market is too much? Too much bonds and too much cash? I said, it, de it depends. I said, sometimes you want 40% bonds and 40% cash and very little stocks. And sometimes you want a lot of stocks and hardly any cash. It depends on what the market's doing. See, they're doing an asset allocation. And now that you're using advisor, hopefully they switch you from mutual funds to ETFs. But I know where we're going. She goes, yeah, now they're using ETFs. I said, so they gave you a pie chart based on your age and station in life. And now they're going to only change it once every semi-annually or, 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 or annually, they'll quote rebalance to make you think that they're doing something. And they set up a pie chart and they're charging you 1% for not really any management. I said, if you really want to do that, I disagree with that strategy. But if you want to do that, I can help you do that in 15 minutes for free. You don't you need to pay somebody. You don't need you to pay the discount. You just nailed the dismount. Don, explain. The it was 214 words, but but we'll we'll you, allow you, it. You, you nailed the dismount now, Don. Explain to uh, the viewers why the, this, the how Danny just nailed the dismount between we're watching your portfolio hourly and you're getting once a quarter. Go ahead, Don. Because the lady went from a pie chart advisor that used mutual funds and allocations to an improved advisor that used ooh ETFs instead of mutual funds, but still a pie chart rebalance once a quarter as opposed to uh, Revere Asset Management, which is watching the market every hour of every day and adjusting portfolios accordingly. If some sort of a uh, sea change happens, a change in character happens with the market. That's the, our rules, our buy rules and our sell rules are, are, there's very few absolutes in life, very few. You will not get 2008 in here. That's the big one. And to, to illustrate that, you know, when the markets were down 35%, what were we down? 5%, 7% respectively in the portfolios? Seven and eight, uh, seven, a little over seven, a little over eight. The market was down 30. There you go. Yeah, 30, 35. And then, and then now, gangbusters, just gangbusters. You want to see one of the best little dog on the screen right here? Hang on, hang on. Best I'd like to add, portfolio I'd, I'd, managers I'd like to, in America. Hang on. I'd like to, I'd like to add one thing that Don said because okay. I want to make sure that doesn't get crossed over. Don said, okay. you know, they shifted from a pie, mutual fund pie chart to an you ETF said shift, pie chart. right? Shift, shift. Oh, oh shift, shift, shift. Transfer. S -A -I. Shift. I. There's S -A -I -F -T. an S H I F T. S shift, shift, okay, shift, shift, shiftery. All right. So all they did. Now hear me out. All they did right. is. Hang on. All they did was shift the way that they're getting paid, the fee structure. So rather than getting 12B1 fees and commissions and trailers, now they're just charging a, 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 an advisory fee with lower ETFs, but the strategy is the same. That's why even if they say they're 
fee-based or even maybe a fiduciary, are they really watching the portfolio itself? You still got the same pie chart with downside risk. What Danny said there, 12B1 fees and trailing fees. So what a lot of people don't realize is mutual funds pay the people, pay, pay advisors, pay brokerage houses to place clients in certain funds. It's a kickback. It's, there's no other way to describe it but a kickback. It's pay to play. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it does harm to you because you, you'll you never know if an advisor placed you in a certain fund because it's a great fund, the manager is great, or if the trailing fee's there. You, you'll never know. And, and it, it's opportunity cost. And so, but it also, we don't do mutual funds unless we manage a bunch of 401ks, unless the, unless the program will not allow us to do individual stocks. But you have to understand that I, I don't think you want 500 stocks. I think indexing is going to go the way of the, of the dodo eventually. Like I know Vanguard's got this huge business. I know indexes are what everyone is in right now, the majority of investors. But when you, when you look at like the five to 10 stocks that make up the S&P 500 that are driving the train, why do you want to own the rest of them? I'm kind of making Uncle Tony, for those of you that are a long time character on the show, Uncle Tony is a great humanitarian, a, a friend of Marines. You couldn't ask for a better human being. But Uncle Tony, Uncle Tony hates ETFs for this exact reason. And, and we use ETFs tactically when it's just advantageous for us to do so. And, and but it's, it, it really, it, it's a more of a long-term argument. We don't use ETFs for the long-term. We use ETFs short-term, get us to where we want to go and we're up and running. But 90% of the time we're doing individual stocks. And I don't think you want an S&P 500 index fund because you're getting you're getting 490 other bad stocks, whereas you get, there's a very small percentage of the stocks that move the market, but but it's not anything new. It's always been that way. It's now just being heightened in the age of, the, the, really, the, it's a good thing that the democratization of information is what allowed people to figure this out. Go ahead, David, what do you want to say? Well, I was going to say, so Uncle Tony actually sent me an email, this, and hmm. he, was, he was trying to help a really good friend who's got their, uh, their, their account over at Wells Fargo and they have this program called Custom Choice. And so they, right. got the advi- they got the advisory fees and then they got the fees from the various mutual funds. They got dividend reinvest fees. So if you get a, di- if you're, if you're, <laughs> who's doing mutual dividend fund invest fees? Wells Fargo on their Custom Choice plan. So when you Wells get Wells Fargo is charging people to reinvest their dividends? Yes, and then they've got a, bond asset reallocation fee. So if you make any what? changes, you, you got to pay, pay a fee. Um, anyway, um, and then the target date, F, guys, which is a whole other thing. The F Wells is not for Fargo, man. Can so you put that anyway, in the show notes, that the uh, F in Wells is not for Fargo? No, I did not, Tim. Could you? I, I, I try to run a clean program. That is a clean program. We're, we're the ones exposing this. Well, Uncle Tony exposed that. How do they charge you to reinvest the dividends? Okay. Like, where do they? And it, you know, it's it's anyway. What it's I heard that, right. I just heard. You know, I I think too what these people, what the problem with these uh, folks, when they get scared, like when the markets get uh, some volatility, and we're not perma bears or perma bulls, we're just participants in the market. But when the markets do have some volatility, people get preyed upon by these annuity and, and insurance salespeople. And I said something on the phone. I think I'm gonna, I don't think I wrote it down properly when we had our morning call. Approach the markets like it's not gonna be all right. If you approach the markets like it's not gonna be all right, you'll always have a sell dis- discipline in place. You'll always be able to protect your wealth. And then if you approach it from that, that, that point of view, you can step in front of stocks and buy them like we bought Tesla earlier today whether it works out or not you know so many people are worried about wins and losses i'm worried about percentage gains and and percentage losses and minimizing my percentage losses and maximizing my percentage gains and my rules allow me to do that hey don real quick do you think you can take me over can we do a quick spac review um nicola shell spac and then i want to throw an mnra in there like i want to talk about the stocks that correct uh, substantially, because I think that's helpful to people right now. Can we do that real quick? Sure. Yeah. NKL, some- NKLA uh, did its investors dirty after the close last Friday. Yeah, it did. 
uh, although they're they're acting like it shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody that read the fine print on the warrants. Which why would you read the fine print on the warrants if you're involved in the common? But there there was a conversion mechanism in there, and they issued a bunch of shares to uh, convert the warrants to common stock, and then also uh, some more shares to I guess add to their coffers. But the the key thing with uh, NKLA, you look at those two big spikes in the middle of that screen right there, the big green one, the big red one, that is a climax top that you need to be able to recognize if you're going to invest in stocks like that. And if you don't take some off the board there, you're just being a pig. And what happens with Nikola now, if you own the stock and you don't know anything about the company, they are at least two years away from having a product. Uh, they have no original equipment manufacturer. They have no way of building this beautiful Badger pickup truck until they partner with somebody uh, that has the capabilities of building a truck or they buy a factory where they can put the line in. Uh, supposedly before that, the uh, semis are going to be available. The semi truck is going to be available and they have to, but they still have to build out their hydrogen stations to be able to charge the hydrogen trucks in order that they run. So this is uh, flat out just really a pipe dream. Uh, at this point, they have the money. They need to execute. They have not been able to execute so far. And the owner, Trevor Milton, it seems like a really big, um, just a pitch man for the stock. And he's abusing the shorts the same way Elon is. But Elon has a product that's being developed. And there's tens of thousands of them on the roads. NKLA is a pipe dream at this point. So, dilution, man, dilute. so they diluted all the common yeah. shareholders with the warrants. They yep. diluted. Yes. And and all they have is 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 cash in a dream. They have. And dream. if you and if you look at the the next bar below where Tim drew that red line, the big gap down. Okay, if you follow the gap rules that I've talked about many times, if that puts a bottom in, fine, you can hold it. But it didn't. It's continued. It had a little bounce for one day, and now three days later, intense mm -hmm. selling below the three ATR. Um, yep. It seems like the hot money which inflated this stock is gone. So now you've got people that have to be true believers left or the hopers left. And uh, this is a big fat avoid. And you can always yeah, get in later once it stabilizes. I sure, mean, sure. Let, let, you know, if NKLA two years from now, brings out has their first quarterly starts selling trucks and has an earnings report and they uh you know they're blown away sales estimate you have plenty of time to make money in this stock and just go back and look at the very first big gap up that tesla had out of its base on monster volume that's the time to get in right and now even if you have problems, what are you gonna do what are you oh, gonna do sorry. for the next two years wait for bits and pieces of uh of news to come out and say we hope this we look at this i mean if you know if they partner with an oem maybe that's positive yeah. news at least they can produce the truck then but that hasn't yeah. happened yet and look if you take the probabilistic mindset let me get this back so i can draw the chart um we don't buy near the three atr you know we wait for a pullback typically unless um the stock meets some other criteria for us fundamentally and technically but let's say that you said tim i didn't buy here i didn't buy here I let it consolidate. I know I know what your rules are. Okay, so then it makes the pullback to the mean, but it breaks it. Well, that's probably a sell there, but you got two closes here below the 21, and that's still in the 50s, by the way, that you're still selling the stock somewhere in the 50s. If you bought it in the 70s and you're like, well, I can't sell it now because it's 50s, well, how do you feel about selling it now in the 30s? And And so it hurts. Like, let's not, we don't own it, Nicola. We, um, Don traded Nicola to a T earlier this year, but uh, we don't own any Nicola. We don't need to. But uh, if, you, if you're stuck in this, you know, there's people stuck in Nicola. Is this SHL? What's Shell doing? Oh, geez. Look at this, Don. What is that's this one? This is the that's, one that's a tortoise. Yeah. They're, yeah that's, um, that's the one that's going to make parts for electric cars. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. And so here, you can apply the probabilistic mindset rules that we talk about uh, 
to any stock. It's just Don and I, in particular, Don and I, uh, we choose. We, we, we choose to employ the rules with about the upper 10%. I've got a hair sticking up on my head that's been distracting me. I just Nobody it. noticed it until you pointed it out. No, I noticed it. It was distracting the hell out of me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, I've got a double chin that's driving me nuts too. So, you know what? That's part of the reason why I, I stand to do this. I look shows. good. I don't no, sit. You, I'm just, Dan, you're beautiful. <laughs> beautiful as always. Yes, Dan. You're, you're, that's your third Danny's, touchdown dance this show now, Dan. Yeah, it is. Trifecta. So you can apply the rules. I want to do uh, like let's talk about uh, I got I got it written down. Oh, there's the actual SPAC SPAC. Is it do I have that right? SPAC? Uh SPAQ. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. Same, Same thing. thing. They, all, they all went on climax runs. Yep. It's brutal. Brutal. This one at least is at the mean. Uh and then MN is it MNRA? What's Moderna? Moderna MR. is not a SPAC. They actually have no, that, that's the vaccine, yeah. Yeah, but MNRA. it's the same. Yeah, this this is a this is a this is a pullback here at a half. But it really it's like the Tesla's pullback where it went on this brilliant run and then and now here's the mean. And so look, whether you're you agree with management, what they did with the stock when they reported the that trial with eight people, <laughs> that's a whole yeah. other story. But it's at the mean. And so you can apply your rules in a probabilistic way to do, but you the, the problem is you have to wait for your pitch. That's the problem. And most people can't wait for their pitch. They can't wait for something like Tesla to come down uh, to the mean to see what happens. And, and and whether or not Tesla does well from here, again, that's not the point. It's just following your mind, your your rules, and then where where are the low the the low risk entry points in these stocks? And so that is absolutely the point of what I wanted to talk about there. Um, Don, I want to do volatility. Volatility products are, uh, I don't know if they're hot right now, but I want to point out something volatility wise. And then Don's got an interesting thing he wanted to talk about. This is the VIX, the cash VIX, the people's VIX. The VIX I make fun of because nobody in our audience, and I don't, is 27 too low for this market? Is 27 too high for this market, uh, the price of the VIX right now? Uh, should the VIX be at 50? For some of you, the VIX should be at like 2. Hundred, you know, you're like the economy sucks, and you're just you're just ba really bearish on it, which is it's your opinion. You can have it. I use the VIX like this, folks. Oh, the cash VIX. Uh, I have Bollinger bands here. They're just standard Bollinger bands, and I want to see how it moves. And when I get a close outside of the Bollinger band, uh, and then back inside, that tells me uh, I've seen that enough times, or that's a signal to lighten up. And if we haven't really closed outside of the Bollinger Band, we've come up to the mid-level and we've gotten rejected here. If you've bought a volatility product because you wanted to hedge yourself, you're, these are tough products, man. Like 2% on the VIX is really difficult and you, and you think it should be up more and it's not. And then the tool that I use consistently, as I set Don up to talk about this, is the VIX futures. This combined with put call ratio, combined with where are we at on the moving averages of the indices. And this has really been a timing mechanism for me to really help me understand when is that moment in time I should start selling some positions a little bit more aggressively and potentially getting a little bit more, getting short potentially. And so this is uh, the current month's contract for the volatility futures. Uh, this is next month's contract the September and then right here is October's these right now are in sequential order meaning that you're going to pay less for something with less time so this has like 30 I just call it 30 days I don't it's not quite 30 days this has 30 days of duration so because it has 30 days less of duration this contract costs less than a contract with 54 days and that costs and that 54 day contract costs less than this contract with 89 days and so if, you, if that doesn't make sense to you, if you had a, I'm gonna draw a card, Danny, I got made fun of for the way I drew, drew something the other week and I forget what. Yeah, it was an like animal. It, uh, it oh. was, uh, it, your animals are just not good, I'm sorry. No. They it, all look the it? same and you've given them seven different names so far, I think. This is an antelope, this is a caterpillar, this oh, is yeah? a, 
giraffe. Is, a I'm gonna write is that is that really a car? Okay, I tried to you say so. It looks, it looks, kind of like an looks like Fred Flintstone drove that. Those big stone well, wheels yeah, on maybe. the bottom. Well, that's a car. And yeah, so, that would do. That's a car. You had a car. car. My, I tell you what, my my boy Rent the Remster, he's got some Barney Rubble feet on him. God, every time we look at his feet, we're like Barney Rubble. And so, anyway, <clears throat> moving moving back to Vix Futures. So Vix Futures, when the current months, like if you had a car rental, and that car rental had thirty days, fifty four days, and eighty nine days, you would expect it to be priced out at one, two, and three dollars. You'd pay more for eighty nine days, less for thirty days. But if for some reason you ended up paying $10 for 30 days, $7 for 54 days, and $5 for 89 days, that doesn't make any sense, right? You wouldn't pay more for less, would you? And so what happens is if this number up here at the top of my screen is gets to become bigger than that number, and that number is bigger than this number, what that's telling you is that professional traders are so concerned about the market dropping and they're the ones that matter the professional traders that trade the vix futures that you should probably pay attention to it. when that vix inverts like that that is a risk is here risk is now metric and i've used that so often um, to help me position better uh for what might come it doesn't always work but again there's no absolutes the last time we did it it, like with the day before that big 1800 point drop in the Dow is when we, we use the signal uh, and it worked to it. It doesn't always work like that, but it's a big positioning tool. Does that make sense? Did I explain that properly? It makes sense and it made sense to the Arkansas teachers retirement system who were sold a product by Allianz hmm. that they would manage volatility for them throughout these treacherous waters. But it ends up that the Arkansas pension fund, mm -hmm. teachers pension fund, lost the tidy sum of $774 million in the Alliance volatility funds lawsuit pending. So, so the like fund seven, that was designed, $774 million. That's in, in volatility products, like uh, I don't think they trade TVIX anymore, but they trade uh, U. The oh, XY. it's not volatility products. See, Allianz is smart. They created a special fund to handle volatility, and that oh, fund Jesus. blew up. They're like Credit Suisse, man. Credit Suisse blows people. All those Credit Suisse exotic products, man, Credit Suisse ruins people. That's an opinion. I'm allowed to have an opinion. Here's a quote. The lawsuit features marketing materials that Allianz – allegedly provided to the pension fund, which touted its volatility trading fund's ability to perform irrespective of the market environment, and the objective was to protect against a market crash. The fund, however, did not protect against a market crash. Wow. Wow. They're not gonna get, they're not gonna get that money back. How long is that, they're gonna spend more money Trying to get that money back, then getting that money back. Uh, they may sell, they may get some up front because they they, they don't want a bad PR. All when you go to court, when you go to court, often most times the lawyers are the only one that win. Like when Wells Fargo, when Wells Fargo got taken to the woodshed uh, for all the account openings and like like I and all the Wells Fargo and stuff that they do to people. Um, you you don't get any better banking or any better client services. You the the shareholders or the or you know the the stakeholders in the bank they don't get anything better. It goes to the government. And it's, as a matter of fact, the shareholders are the ones that get hurt because it it, it ruins the earnings. Yeah. Well, th this is going to go through the regulatory bodies since the arbitration. But you're right, you're right. It's still gonna. It's still. Say, do they outlaw these products? Because uh, I, I I know how you. I, I don't want to. I don't want to make this political. And some of you are like buyer beware. You you shouldn't. You know you should know what you buy. I get it, man. But there are some really good salespeople out there. And it's a slippery. It's a slippery slope. But at the very least, they definitely need to bring all the forward contracts onto an exchange and standardize them so you can see them and they're transparent. I. 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 I, I just feel bad. Like I. I outlawing products 
I, I don't think people understand. If you take it just a step further to simple, you know, simplify it a little bit, I don't think people understand the duplication that exists in their mutual funds. Like you, you, you think you're, you think you're diversified, and diversification just means it's a lazy person's way to to, to claim that they're they're doing the right thing. Buy you, you can't be a fiduciary if you've got the same. You've got 20 different mutual funds, five different mutual funds, but there, there's only so many investable stocks, and they and you're duplicated. You can't be a fiduciary if you buy and hold. But they're sold this. They're sold on diversification. There's... Well, well, here's here, here's the problem I have. You know, for exotic uh, products or private equity, you got to be a credit investor. You got to be pretty well off, where they think, well, you're wealthy, so you can afford to hire your own advisors to analyze this stuff. And if you lose your money, it's your fault. But for the regular investor, they can't really afford to lose a lot of money. Now, here with this with this uh, pension fund, retirement fund the people that are hurt are the rank and file employees. You're right, Tim, they're not accredited, but they've got that board, the trustees on that plan are supposed to be their fiduciaries and watch out for these people. Oh. And they got, they got hoodwinked. So it's, this is going to be an ugly, sticky uh, thing because Allianz, you know, obviously persuaded these board of trustees. This is a way to, this is a way to go. It's going to be That's interesting. interesting. And when you say the board of trustees, imagine the people in your school district or your the benevolent uh, firefighter society or police association. They're just regular people, right? They're just yeah, like you. I mean. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for and them, that's, and that's and that's why they should shouldn't have these exotic derivatives yeah. or 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 products inside these plans. They ought to either be, even though I don't like mutual funds, you know. ETFs, individual mutual funds, and what they really ought to do is they ought to open these up and let people self-direct their their portion if they so choose to be able to have individual stocks. But hey, that's just me. That's simple. Mind. And the reason why they don't self-direct. So what Danny's saying is, instead of being stuck in mutual funds or ETFs, you should be able to do what you want: ETFs, mutual funds, or individual stocks. The reason why these companies don't, the 401k managers or the, the pension managers, they're getting the 12, the 12B1 fees that we're always talking about. It's it's coming back full circle where they're getting a kickback. No, that, they're also they have, too. Yeah, it's not yeah, just 12B1 yeah. fees. It's, it's incestuous. Yeah, and so that's why you don't have a choice. And look, I, I a lot of these, I don't want to go accusing the the people on the boards that choose the programs, they're either your fellow co-workers, your employees. I'm not saying they're being wined and dined because I know there's supposed to be uh, rules against that, but they're being romanced. Yeah, look at Danny's face, yep. They're being romanced and- I've seen it, man, trust me. And, that, and listen to me, that romance is not, it's not good. It, it, <laughs> The, the romance that takes place between the salespeople and the committee of your 401k plan, it's not good. And I don't know what you do to eliminate it. I, but there, you know, the committee can only make a decision uh, based on the information they're given. And so that if you're, if you're lied to, you know, do they, you know what, that's interesting because do they, are the board are the committee members indemnified from making a bad decision like that they they can be they can they can have an indemnification thing and they can also farm out so a lot what a lot of these big plans do is they'll find an investment management service company trustee company to to manage and look over and make recommendations and those people sure. a lot of times can get insured and bonded so, so, all right, let's do this. I've got uh, one last more topical thing I want to talk about. I want to do moves that we made this week and where we see the markets going. I don't know if I'll have time to get into options trades. I've been covering options trades pretty heavily in the weekly videos. But let's do this real quick because this is more broad. Um, dividend stocks are screwing you. I, I do want to cover that because it's more timely. But hey, Don. Hey Tim. Oh, yes. It's time for the it's time for the weekly uh, sports card disposal update plan, though. They're they're 
there's, there's been no up, there's been no update same as the there's last no daily <laughs> Since I said, but in the last mystery pack, so this is a, I, I bought a third one. <laughs> so in the mystery pack that I opened up, <laughs> this card, I'm sorry, I'm choking because I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> this cut this uh, Ken Griffey Jr. card, it's like a hundred, $150 card. So it's, it's got a glare to it. So excited inside the mystery pack, best mystery pack I ever opened it. Let me tell you something, stock nerds and market lovers. That's how you diversify your portfolio, sports cards. So let me <laughs> let me show you. Set three hundred dollars, get one hundred and fifty back. <laughs> Stop with the facts. Uh, I just oh, can't hey, believe there's no gum in there. It's the only oh, sports package. Gum. It's the Allianz Sports Package. Look at this. Nora is three months old today. Uh, that little girl cannot believe three months have gone by. Where? Did I, if you want to follow us on Twitter, Stock Nerds, uh, where did I do that? Um, it's somewhere here. Uh, anyway, if you want to follow us on Twitter, oh, man, maybe next week we'll do the uh, – if you missed the stocks under $10 screen, I'm not going to do it today. Go to uh, – you can find it on Twitter or email me. I'll give you our email addresses here in a second. We'll send you the screen. If you want the stocks under ten dollars screen, we're more than happy to do that. Where is? Oh, there it is. This is the video where mystery box explosion. Anyway, if you want to follow us uh, on Twitter at TJ Razor, the reason why I'm telling you this is because I stopped giving out my phone number. You can direct message me. Just let me know you follow me. I'll follow you back. Don Vandenborg, right here. That's whoo, there you go. Don. Don. Yep, at D Vandenborg, and that's how you get a hold of Don. And then uh, one Danny Stewart, as we talked about earlier, is uh, Danny's handle. Look, just follow us. And then the easiest thing to do is, hey, hey guys, send us a message on Twitter. Hey, I followed you. Can you follow me back? And then you're more than welcome to message us right there. And then we, Twitter is brevity. You, some people send emails and they're just freaking long. And, and that's okay. You can send us long messages. It just takes a while to clean out the inbox. And so the easier thing to do Stock nerds and market lovers, the easier thing to do is go to Revere Asset and just call us. I know it's not 21st century technology, the telephone, but when you have questions that are very specific to you or a strategy you want explained more, it's just easier to pick up the phone. 855-732-5932. Don't worry. Look, if you call us, I'm going to circle the person who's going to answer the phone. Hold on. Let me circle that right there. That's who's going to answer the phone. He's not, he's not going to, we don't have any salespeople. He's not going to uh, call you 10 times next week uh, to get you to buy uh, the Allianz Volatility Fund. Ask your questions, get your answers, and move on. We're too busy. We're gro the firm's growing because of the stock nerds and market lovers that, and thank you, that are sending us your loved ones and becoming clients of the firm. And Look, if you want to become a client of the firm, it's super duper easy. It, it's a couple DocuSign forms away, 855-732-5932. The strategies to which we do for our clients every day, every hour, are things that we can do for you. And understanding how we buy at something called the block level, how we trade institutionally, whether or not you become a client, it's interesting to find out about too. So call us, uh, ask your questions, and then if you want to email us, that's fine. I, you can see, see I'm discouraging email because it, it just takes a long time to get back. My inbox gets full. I know Don's does as well. Don at Revere Asset, Tim at Revere Asset, and then America's fiduciary here. And if that stirred the cockles of your heart about Danny and life insurance, Danny has actually gotten on the phone with some of these companies, and he's gotten you out of some things. He can't guarantee it, but as America's fiduciary, he takes his Captain America shield, he puts on his little Captain America hat, and he goes to bat for you. We don't we don't charge for that. We just we just help you. And so if you've been taken advantage of in that regard, or you think you've been taken advantage of, I encourage everybody to reach out to Danny. So and I, and I do answer my email, so you can email me. I, it's not that I don't answer, Danny. They're just long. No, no, it's and, so long. Yeah, like I, like hey Tim, you described something you called an iron fly in the in, in the video. Can you explain that to me on email? Christ, did you see me just draw a car? No, I don't I don't know if I can, I don't know if I'm talented enough to actually explain. I can do it with my voice. I don't know if I can do it with my words. So it's hard to describe without pictures. I need pictures. And so that's why 
Twitter, I can I can direct you to a video resource, or I can actually just do a video for you, which I don't mind doing as well. Um, oh, I want to talk about this real quick. Look, this is a, a favorite source of mine, Investors Business Daily, but uh, this article is really interesting. How investors lost a fifth of their money on the stock yielding 3%. Look, I want to just read this real quick to you. This is where I read to you. Uh, not meant to put you to sleep, but it's meant it's meant to dispel a myth that dividend stocks are the bee's knees. They're not, and there's a reason why. So all ten of the largest dividend ETFs, and this is just written a week ago, all ten of the largest dividend ETFs, including Vanguard, uh, all the Vanguard ETFs, the Spider dividend ETF, are down so far in 2020, says Investors Business Daily, after looking at these things on a program called Market Smith. You see Don using Market Smith all the time in his videos. Investors lost money in all 10 of these dividend ETFs, even if you add back the full year dividend coming into the end of the year. Some of these losses are head turned. The nearly 13 billion in assets iShare Select Dividend ETF, DVY, which owns 100% dividend paying stocks, is down, listen to this, is down 24% this year. That leaves investors 21% in the hole if you add in the 3.1 yield at the start of the year. Meanwhile, growth stocks, as you know, like we're wildly in the green here at Revere, have been doing much, much better. Safer, this is a quote. I actually, I don't know who this guy is, but uh, Michael Farr says he's a money manager with a firm. He says, safer meant suckier for a number of years. Uh, this is why growth stocks don't pay dividends. And so, there's a real interesting thing here. More than one in 10 S&P 500 companies have frozen their dividend in the first half of 2020, and, or they've cut it all together. And so dividend stocks, Danny, am I boring you? Are you tweeting? I'm sorry, no, no, I'm not tweeting. We can see you. That's the, the you're on camera. We can see when your head I goes just down. down but how come you weren't giving you, you Don when Don's up there like that looking at the charts? How come it's just me? I, Cause Don, Don's looking at the charts. Cause I'm making money. Folks, here's the bottom line. A dividend stock pays you 3%. It's down 25. Did you make money? No. You're down 22%. All right. Let's move on. Next topic. Uh -oh. How about that, a hedge I just put on? Oh, really? You just put the hedge on? Tell me about it. I did. QQQ failed on its balance into the 21-day exponential moving average. If that holds it's a good low risk entry for qid or sqqq let's do qqq there you go so, so let's go is, let's go daily first this is daily let me That's get on daily. a chart yeah let yeah me get, not an atr chart oh so slow i i swear to god don i hit we'll just we'll just wait for that to maybe magically come up there it goes now it's up so here you go so the QQQ bounced right into the 21-day exponential moving average, which was uh, around 256.26. Mm -hmm. And yep. then if you switch to a five-minute chart, it hung around there for from like uh, for about an hour, and then rolled over. And that is the lowest risk uh, entry point for a short on the Nasdaq 100. There you go. Like it. So Don, you see that managing the portfolio even while we speak. Ain't no dividend ETF gonna be doing that for you today. <laughs> what else do I tell you what, what else have you done? But they can tell you about how bad it failed at the next quarterly review, blame it on the manager, and then put you in something different. You oh, know that's what? A that's a rebound. I've made it a fact to go after uh, what I believe are the injustices in this industry, which are the annuity salespeople, the life insurance salespeople, and the 12B1 hustlers. But I, I think you're right, Don. I think the next, the next part of the Legion of Doom that we should go after are the quarterly reviewists. And, and then what happens is, and, and people who have been through this will recognize exactly what we're about to say. You sit down for a quarterly review and the, and the guy across from you has um, not done you right. And somehow in the conversation, he'll end up blaming you. And he'll blame it on your risk tolerance or he'll, he or she will blame it on. Yeah, this the, is what the, you the, somehow, 
yeah, somehow during the discussion, you're going to be the person at fault. And they're going to look at you at some point during the conversation and say, well, what would you like to do? And I can't imagine. Like, what do you mean, what would I like to do? Aren't you this about? Guy? How about the new one that we heard this week from uh, uh, the guy that we're talking to about the website redesign? He went in with his wife for his quarterly review. And because he was in a more conservative portfolio, the guy gave him kudos. You should have seen the losses of some of these other people so that they oh, yes, go away yes. feeling better. Yeah. And, it, and by the way, that could just be made up. You know, hey, you think you have it bad. I almost lost all of the client's money and a couple other funds. So, look, a quarter, I think if we got people to stop with the quarterly reviews, and look, we're, there's people that want to do away with quarterly reports on companies. Well, that's over trading. Uh, look, and Don, uh, mentally get ready to report your drawdown stats, okay? Because this is why this matters. Look, everyone will draw you the lower left to the upper right tell you that stocks only go up and look you can't argue when you look at a chart from 1920 to 2020 about the stocks but the little known secret is that the indices are actually actively traded meaning when companies merge or they underperform they drop off the company names drop off and so look no indice you know s p doesn't want a bunch of laggards in there uh the russell doesn't want a bunch of laggards in there they rotate the ones that don't meet the criteria or they're just not doing well why would ge get kicked out of the dow like they could have kept it for nostalgia's sake but they kicked their asses to the curb because they're underperforming they're dragging the dow down <laughs> and so it was the last it was the last original dow stock yeah and so it's like wrigley field they're not going to knock wrigley field down but wrigley field's not underperforming people want to go there all the time you know unless they get the coronavirus then they don't want to go there whole another story so but the the problem is if you suffer those blips and depending upon where you are you know they always tell you well if you're young you should be buying every dip but then you get to be 40 and you have kids and you're like hold on a minute i just saw my you know 500k in a 35 percent correction you know go down go go down significantly and then you get to be 50 and maybe you have closer uh to a million and you'd suffer a 35 percent correction and you see that that's a big hit and you don't have to suffer those but the whole industry is geared towards you absorbing the blows of their mistakes and if you just had a different mindset you can absolutely thrive and don can you explain what i'm trying to talk about it's the mindset, it's understanding the sequence of returns, first of all, which is, Tim Tim touched on it a little bit, but you cannot afford the 35% uh, drawdown as you approach retirement. You've been given a gift with this bounce back. Now let's, let's talk about uh, the drawdowns that we've had since 2000. You know, it was a once in a lifetime internet bust. Mm -hmm. Then in 2008, it was a once in a lifetime financial crisis. Then in uh, the fourth quarter of 2018, it was because the Fed was offsides when we dropped 20% in, in two and a half months. And then the beginning of this year, you've never seen a pandemic before, so we dropped 35% in uh, four months or four weeks. Uh, there are simple, there's one simple rule, obey the 200 day moving average, that will keep you out of trouble. I did a, uh, be, uh, stay clear of the bear with Revere. We did it in January of this year. This was our plan, trying to get the word out after the nice bounce back that you had in 2019, after the 20% sell off in Q4 2018. Go back and review it. It reviews the last 11 bear down. markets, what the drawdowns mm -hmm. are, where what your expected drawdown. You should never really lose more than 12% off the top. Uh, until you break the 200-day moving average on a daily ba on a weekly basis on the S&P 500, that's your exit signal. The market does not get into serious trouble until you close on a weekly basis below the 200-day moving average uh, on the S&P 500. That's the line in the sand. And then just wait for the dust to clear. On average, you drop a so, next another 27% after that happens, uh, and then there are different rules for getting back in which we talk about here all the time, but worst case scenario, do not stay in the market when the market breaks the 200 day moving average on a weekly basis. 
so with our way of doing things on a hundred thousand dollar account don what was the average account down if they just did the traditional advisor brotherhood thing just your standard edward jones raymond james bank of america wells fargo right so for this for the COVID crisis the average is 12 percent uh and this one we saw a little bit worse it was 13 percent. so your hundred thousand dollars would have dropped to eighty seven thousand dollars with revere you, asset with revere well with a, with this long-term approach worst case scenario we did better our year to date never got to the double digits yep. so uh there was an additional drop 34 percent. so now you're at the bottom your third your hundred thousand dollars is now uh sixty six thousand dollars now granted you've rebounded but you're rebounding from down 34 percent. we're rebounding from down 12 percent, and the gains that you add to when you start from 87,000, I mean, the, the gap between 66,000, 87,000, you have $21,000 that you saved and you're building, you're compounding from that higher amount than you are if you wrote it the whole way down, not to mention the mental capital that you, that you, exp uh, that you spent not sleeping at night worrying about where the bottom was on your account. No, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not paralyzed by fear. Right. And let's be honest, people say they have a, you know, moderately aggressive risk tolerance, and they lose 30, 35%, they say, uncle, they get out, and they don't ever get back in. They don't get that balance you're talking about, Don. Yeah, one thing I learned from you, Dan, you know, is the risk is in the market. Uh, like the guy we talked to about the web design, you know, he had a more conservative portfolio, but should he be that conservative? How about if you get conservative when the market turns bad, but you stay aggressive when the market is healthy? You could have made, yeah. we've made outsized returns during this bounce by going with the, the strongest stocks and the strongest sectors in, a, in this uh, bounce back up to the upside, because that's just the way the market works. It's not our opinion, it's a fact. And hold on a second, I'm gonna illustrate this point, because uh, and it doesn't have to be uh, the Amazons, uh, the Netflixes, the Zooms of the world. Let me show you something that we did uh, in stock and ETF portfolio. And I covered this maybe last week, and it was based off the bond trade, how bonds were uh, signaling um, lower yields for, say, like a 30-year mortgage. So here's TLT, which we own in the shop. So there's TLT uh, just kind of cruising along there. Uh, and if you look at 10-year notes, 10-year uh, notes continue to go higher, which means uh, uh, TNX is the yield. The 10-year treasury yield continues I can draw continues to fall, and so Rachel, what, what is that? Yep, yeah, what is that good for? Well, that's good for housing. And so at the end of last month, beginning of this month, I started accumulating uh, stocks like MTH, like Meritage, stocks like D, uh, DRO. Do I am I about to do it again, Danny? DHI. Yes. I was about to do Tartan Restaurant every time. Uh, Dr. Horton, and and even to like a restoration hardware, which takes advantage of this. And then you know, on another spectrum, there's what which Walmart's actually not really performing that well in relation to those other stocks. But you could have done a number of things, like for uh, some of the clients, they got ITB or XHB, and those have performed well. And so it it's not just you know crowding into what everybody else is doing. It's actually uh, uh, being able to screen and find those ideas. And I, that's that's probably one of the most asked questions, like, well, how do you find your ideas? Well, that, that's what we get paid to do. We screen. We're screening for certain criteria that allow us to get into trades and allow us to see if they work. It's not just following the crowd per se. Is that me? I'm trying to, I don't know if I'm articulating this yeah, very yeah, well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Look, you're, you're screening for the strongest sectors, and then you're also looking within those sectors to find individual stocks. So smaller accounts may just get the sector ETF. Mid-size accounts will get a combination of both, as will the larger uh, yes. uh, accounts. And so it's a way to, you know, because look, too much diversification is, is, is mediocre. And by the way, when it goes down, you don't want diversification because it all goes down together. No. That's when you want cash. Because Don's saying outsized gains. Well, how do you get those outsized gains? It's not uh, cynically. Sometimes people say everybody's smart in a bull market, but when you when it gets a little volatile, sometimes the right thing to do isn't to buy more. 
like here's Zoom. Zoom's now trading it lower. It's trading a little bit lower than it was last week. And so uh, maybe it's not the time uh, to buy to buy TDOC. I, I don't know, but it's not piling in to what was working. I'm not saying TDOC's not gonna work. I'm saying Zoom's gonna work. It's It's being able to find where you are in time and space in the market and then execute on your plan. Yeah, and listen, yeah, the, the, the saying that you're referring to, Tim, is don't confuse genius with a bull market. But on the flip side of that, where you really figure out who know, you know, the, the, the men from the boys, the women from the girls, where, who, who know how to manage money is when it's downside. What do you do when the market corrects? It's easy when the market's going up. It's when the market's going down that you really have to it's have a plan. And that, you have to have a plan in advance. Yeah. That's why people, I, I, I get why uh, people always say, I want to see your returns. I want to see your returns. I, I, I wait every day for the, for the day we get a client, a potential client that says, how are you going to protect my wealth? Well, I want the first question to be, how are you going to protect my downside risk? This is what I've got for retirement. How are you going to protect it? It's the right question. Everybody comes to us with how much can you grow it by? And I really want you to think of how can you not lose it all? Because how much risk did you take to get those returns? That's the question. That's, that's yeah. Because I, I that 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 article that I just read quickly through about the dividend ETFs, you're gonna get sold that that's a conservative portfolio. There's nothing conservative about that underperformance. And so how do you protect the downside? How do you protect from getting 2008? And look, I don't know how this is all going to turn out, but um, we're just going to play the market in front of us and, and, and operate in that regard. So Don, what are you expecting for next week? Do I don't ever expect next? anything, but I yeah. look for uh, support and resistance. And if they're tested, what happens? That um, sure. today's low. Today is an inflection point. So we had two inflection okay. points this week. The first one was on Monday when leaders uh, strongly outperformed uh, the market. Right. They had they had been lagging for about a week and a half. Uh, they strongly outperformed. Um, a lot of them made new highs, but it didn't hold. We we had a small gap up on Tuesday, and it's been all downhill since then for leaders. We're now down at 250 is a huge support level for the NASDAQ 100, the QQQ. We bounced off that today, but on the bounce back up, we reversed at the 21 day exponential moving average, which was the reason for the hedge I just talked about. Uh, we need bulls need to get back above today's high and the 21 day exponential moving average next week for this run that started with a follow through day on April 6th to continue. On the downside, uh, or on the flip side, the S&P 500 is, has been outperforming the NASDAQ, uh, and it hasn't touched its 21-day exponential moving average this week. We need to stay uh, above that. That's another key level, and that level is 31.85 on the S&P 500. So watch 250 on the QQQ, and watch uh, 31.85 on the S&P 500. Any breaches of those are uh, are really a change in character for the market. And I'll, I'd like to point out, because um, I saw the word sell off a lot in some headlines last night before I did the videos. This is a weekly SPX chart. This is a beautiful flat base that's developing. And so, look, uh, it's it's just doing this little serpentine here. And then I don't know if it does this or does this, but here's what I do know that there's never been a moment in time going, you know, here's like last year where you don't check back to that 21 period moving average. And if you get two closes below it on a daily or weekly basis, that's typically a shift in trend. Here's two closes below it on a weekly basis at, you know, close to 3000 and here you want all the 2200. So even though this is a weekly chart, you're still not too late. Even if we check all the way back here to 3,000 again, that's still a bullish flat base. And so you you just want to know where you are in time and space. The path right now isn't very clear. And so, um, and a lot of talk is being made 
uh, to say a chart of, uh, let's do gold first. A lot of talk is being made with gold. And so uh, gold could be a lot of things. Uh, is it a safety trade? Is it, uh, is it for inflation? Uh, from, you know, it could be a lot of things, but understanding that you're at the third ATR, the probabilities of just zooming higher, it can happen and it can, it can most certainly happen. But if you think you missed gold, it, this goes back to the discussion we had uh, just a while ago about waiting for your pitch. Because here's uh, February of this year, as gold is making its run to the third ATR, look at what happened to gold. That's, that's it, really when the market's sinking, look at what happened to gold. And so you just want to be really careful about getting over leveraged here. And we've got great positions. And uh, I got GLDM, GDX. Don, do you still have Nugget? I do have Nugget and GLD in some of the asset allocation yeah. uh, portfolios. And then, um, and then when you're looking at silver, and Don has had a brilliant trade in PAAS, Pan American Silver. But when I'm looking at silver, and so look, just because silver here goes up to the third ATR, it can just pull back gently. But here it gives up most of that little run there, if you look at the uh, pricing there. And now you're flagging out. That's super duper bullish. But maybe it flags out a little bit longer while these start to catch up. It doesn't mean it has to crash. It just means that you don't have to chase. That even, even in something that's moving this, have, this, this, this much, it can give, as I try to struggle with the mouse, it can give you a pause and you can just let, you can see how things react. And so there's just no need to chase, even, even in this market environment, maybe. And sometimes if you're unsure, cash is also a position. It's okay when, the, when if, you're, if you're investing for yourself or trading for yourself, sometimes take a break. Cash is a position too. And, and think, about, uh, think about this, the, the XLK, XLY and XLC, now make up huge huge uh, percentages of the S and P 500. Meanwhile, banks and um, transports and oil uh, are, are their percentages way down in the S and P 500. Even a little bit of money flowing out of tech and into those sectors is really going to pump those sectors up because of the very small percentage within the S and P 500 that they make up. So you take out three percentage points of the XLK and move that into banks and financials and move that into oil, those on a percentage basis, those sectors are going to go through the roof because of how beaten down the stocks are. I've got an alert set, a really nice little cup and handle forming on IYT. Uh, last Friday's mm -hmm. high, if that breaks above that, uh, that could run. Uh, banks, KBE, uh, are actually at the high for the week as money has has flown out of the text this week. Um, what was the other one I mentioned? Okay, XLE. I don't like XLE because of how heavy it is with uh, with Chevron and Exxon, but OIH Oil Services uh, also at highs of the week as money has flowed into those two sectors. And what's common, folks, is just like if you take it, just know where you are in time in space and look you can go well tim third h chart it zoomed up those are the anomalies folks it, it manage trailing up the stop managing the managing it it it's so important when you're when you're rotating you're trying to play the rotation Hopefully and that, that big sense. that big spike above the atr that way that was that huge three-day move out of uh out of uh tech and into value yep. that happened uh back at the beginning of june and they sucked you in and yeah, and it happened. may it, it may just be a tactical way to make money. It doesn't mean that you buy it and think you're going to hold oil for the next six months. Again, Great you point. just play the charts. Great point. So, <clears throat> Don, we're going to do this. Uh, a couple more stocks uh, for maybe one more stock for the watch list. Uh, I want to show people where they can find your class. And so, if you go all the classes that you've ever done. So, if you go to uh, Revere Asset daily market insight and if you just click the video i put in all the videos i do but if you just click look click for the video uh it says look for the self confirmation right here is a link to all of don's classes and it takes you 
right to this YouTube page. And so all the classes done is done are absolutely positively right here. You can watch all of them and then they can become your trading plan too. So Danny, let's do this. Let's do uh, the normal closeout. I'm going to kick it back to Don and then we'll, uh, maybe I've got one more thing and then we'll end the show. Folks, listen, if you liked what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor, just send them, send them to revereasset.com. You know, tell them to sign up for our uh, daily market insight and this uh, radio podcast and also the webinars, Don's uh, lunch and learns that he does once a month. Um, we promise we won't, you know, reach out to them or spam them or hassle them it's up to them to reach out to us if they want they can get a free portfolio review you can ask us questions you can email any of us preferably me at dan at revereasset.com tim at revereasset or don at revereasset you can follow us on twitter at the number one danny stewart at tj Riazor, and at d vandenborn and you can also also call us old school at 855 real well Okay, Don, uh, give us one more thing uh, heading into the next week, please. The retail discount and variety sector. I bought Ollie uh, this week on a big move up. They raised guidance, but they all look good. Five FIVE, Dollar Tree, DLTR, Dollar General, DG, and uh, Big Lots, BIG. Uh, they oh, all look the good. Notorious BIG. And so those are five additional stocks for a watch list. And so with that, fellow stock and market lovers, we love you. Thank you so much for investing your time with us. We will see you next week on Your Money.